What's all the fuss about the shoulder girdle anyways? I don't know. Let's find out. Dr. Gooden here with an intro to the shoulder girdle as well as the bony landmarks. Okay, here we are in the shoulder girdle slides. And don't forget this comes from the Manual of Structural Kinesiology by R.T. Floyd, adapted by me. Okay, so some background about the shoulder girdle. Now, it's really interesting that the entire upper extremity depends upon the shoulder girdle to act and function as a base of support, especially given that the only bony attachment of the upper extremity to the torso is via the scapula, and the clavicle, right at the sternoclavicular joint. So that sternoclavicular joint is right here, sternum, clavicle. This is really the pivot joint for the entire shoulder girdle. And there, if you follow the clavicle out into its uh, chromioclavicular joint at the chromium process of your scapula, um, that's, that's the second joint right there. And your entire upper extremity uh, depends on that bony linkage for its connection to your um, thorax. So here is a picture of it. Here's the sternoclavicular joint I was talking about. And over here is the acromioclavicular joint. You can see the clavicle right here and the scapula. So the scapula and the clavicle, because of these linkages, they move as a unit. Um, the clavicle's articulation as I mentioned before, its only articulation is with the sternum. You can see how if we drew the humeral head in here, articulating with the glenoid fossa, how the linkage goes from your arm to the scapula, then into the clavicle, and then to the sternum. So your shoulder girdle is responsible for that linkage between your torso and your arm. Now some key bony landmarks that you should be able to identify. Um, I'll show you on the screen and then I'll show you on myself as best I can as well. So the manubrium is right here at the top of your sternum. Then the clavicle, if you follow the manubrium laterally and you trace that bony ridge at the top of your chest, that would be your clavicle. The coracoid process is going to be just inferior to that down here. You can feel it on the anterior aspect of your shoulder. The acromion process is going to be the most lateral bony aspect um, at the superior aspect of your shoulder. The glenoid fossa, we obviously can't palpate that, but that's going to be important to know because that's where your humerus articulates. Then we have the lateral and the uh, medial borders of the scapula, and they meet at the um, inferior angle down here. Okay, and it's hard to trace those on yourself as far as the scapular bony landmarks, but if you had a partner, you could trace it with them. You just get your hands on their scapula. And what I like to do is actually um, kind of cup their scapula where the, where the inferior angle hits right between my thumb and pointer finger, and then I can find the medial and lateral angles like that. You can do that on both sides and sort of trace the, those uh, borders of the scapula up. You find your manubrium where both of your clavicles uh, meet and articulate. You can feel when you do shoulder elevation, shoulder girdle elevation, you can feel that clavicle going up and down. So there's your sternoclavicular joint. Trace the clavicle outwards all the way to the acromion process, which is at that lateral superior bony aspect of your shoulder. And I found it right here. And if you go inferior and slightly medial from that, there's a, a hard sort of, sort of part. It's surrounded by flesh, but usually it's um, maybe a little bit tender. There's a lot of, of um, of tendons that run through here, but this is where your coracoid process is. If you've ever had a shoulder impingement syndrome from too much bench pressing or something like that, or, or volleyball serving or something, then that's kind of where you feel that pain. Um, I, can't, I can't really do the scapular um, palpations on myself, but what I like to do is I use my thumb and forefinger to find the borders and the inferior angle of both scapula, so you can trace the borders like that. And then from there, I like to orient myself so I can see scapular movement. Okay, some more bony landmarks. Uh, we talked about the acromion process uh, here. This is just from a different angle. And the glenoid fossa, this is what it looks like. That kind of cup shape, it's very shallow. So there's not a lot of 
um, nice passive structure for that humeral head to articulate with, and that's uh, one reason why the rotator cuff is so important and why it can get injured very easily. Um, let's see, we've got the inferior angle again with the medial border, the lateral border, and this is a this is a posterior view, so you can see now the spine of the scapula, which you can actually trace if you're behind somebody, and again, palpating their scapula, you can come up to that ridge, that bony ridge at the top of their scapula before you crest over into their upper trapezius, upper and middle trapezius, and that's going to be the spine of the scapula, and it ends uh, laterally with the acromion process. Now on your clavicle, we have the sternal and uh, acromial ends, so we'd have the manubrium, over here, oops, over here that it articulates with, and then here's the acromial end and the conoid tubercle right here. Okay, the shoulder girdle or the scapula thoracic joint will move along the rib cage due to joint motion that occurs at the sternoclavicular or SC and the acromioclavicular or AC joints, right? Okay, so here and a little bit to a lesser degree here. And that movement allows the glenoid fossa to actually reposition um, to allow the humerus to have a greater range of motion. So it, without the repositioning of our glenoid fossa, the shoulder joint would have a limited range of motion. We can only abduct to about 90 degrees or so and then any further range of motion needs to be allowed by our scapula repositioning to allow for the humerus to continue to move. Remember, it's a really shallow articulation that glen, glen, um, the glenoid fossa is. And because of that, the shoulder is somewhat unstable, especially compared to the hip. So in order to get greater ranges of motion, um, it, the actual, the entire scapula repositions so that the musculature can continue to maintain decent tension so that the uh, rotator cuff can continue to hold the humeral head into the glenoid fossa. So that's how we achieve some degree of stability at our shoulder and maintain a high degree of mobility. Now the sternoclavicular joint, this is um, an arthrodial classification of joint movements in relation to the manubrium. So if you, from the frame of reference of the manubrium, it can move anteriorly 15 degrees with protraction, posteriorly 15 degrees with retraction, Elevation, 45 degrees, or superiorly 45 degrees with elevation, so shoulders up to your ears, kind of doing that dance from Black Panther, and inferiorly 5 degrees with depression. And there are some slight rotary or gliding movements at this joint as well. The AC joint, on the other hand, has 20 to 30 degrees total of gliding and rotational movement, which accompany other shoulder girdle and shoulder joint um, motions. Now the scapula thoracic joint, as I mentioned before, it's not a true synovial joint because it doesn't have synovial features like a synovial membrane or fluid, etc. But, but the scapula do articulate across the rib cage. So the movement, as I've already mentioned, and I would just want to drive the point home, it depends on movement of the SC and the AC joints. And we have 25 degrees of protraction and retraction, 60 degrees of upward and downward rotation. So these are, pretend my hands are scapulae and they're upward rotating and downward rotating and 55 degrees of elevation and depression. It is supported dynamically by its musculature. Okay, I've already mentioned that we, the muscles that support the scapula are important because they stabilize it and they also help the shoulder to be able to position better for higher ranges of motion. It doesn't have any, any ligamentous support. So the important thing that I want to take, uh, so the important thing that I want you to take away from this video specifically is not only the bony landmarks that we covered, right? So the manubrium, points in the clavicle, the scapula and those bony landmarks that we traced. Uh, make sure you practice tracing those on somebody and yourself. But the other important thing to remember is that the scapula thoracic joint is important because it aids in the stability and mobility of the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint is inherently unstable. And so we need lots of attachment points for muscles that cross the shoulder to help stabilize it 
and um, a way for the shoulder to gain some extra mo mobility so that we can interact with our surroundings through a full range of motion. And we achieve that by repositioning the glenoid fossa due to the shoulder girdle movements. And in that next video, we'll be covering the shoulder girdle movements, so make sure you check that one out. Okay, that was the background and bony landmarks of the shoulder girdle. Head on over to this link to check out the joint movements. If you had any questions, leave them down in the comments and I will get back to you. See you over on the next video.